1,200 years ago on this stormy headland stood a thriving monastery, a community of monks and nuns ruled over by a powerful Anglo-Saxon princess. Her aim was to spread the word of God and to convert the pagans to Christianity, but less than 200 years later the monastery had vanished and its remains lay forgotten for over a thousand years. Time Team have come to Hartlepool in Northumbria to try and find the heart of this mysterious place, the site where her followers lie buried and the church where Princess Hild presided. We've been invited to the headland at Hartlepool by Tees Archaeology and County Archaeologist Robin Daniels, who's been working in the area for several years and will be helping us on our dig. How do we actually know that there is an Anglo-Saxon monastery around here somewhere? Well, in 1833, workmen were building houses here and they found human bones and uh, Anglo-Saxon artefacts. And the Durham Advertiser of Friday, July the 12th, 1833, records these workmen finding the, the human bones and the uh, name stones that were buried with them. Where exactly was that? Just over there. Where Phil is? That's right, yes. And there's one of the name stones on display in the church as well. The discovery of these name stones or grave markers was the first indication that Hartlepool was the site of the lost monastery of Heratua, where St Hilda and her followers helped to reintroduce Christianity to a pagan England. Phil's opening a trench in the front garden of number three South Crescent. He'll be looking for evidence of Anglo-Saxon graves to verify the location of the nun's graveyard, first mentioned 170 years ago in those old newspaper reports. Oh, a I, oh, there's a cable. What we've done, we up, cut through it. Once Phil's sorted his cables out, he'll try to establish whether the Victorian builders have left any graves intact for us to study. And because the headland's now so heavily developed, we'll have to carry out keyhole archaeology to establish the size and layout of the site. We'll be searching for evidence of the monastery church, other monastic buildings and the boundary ditch. Our new information would be used to create a model of this headland as it would have looked 1300 years ago. Phil's Trench is right on the coast, but we also need to find the heart of the monastery. So we're looking at the area around the present church, which was built several hundred years after the monastery disappeared. There are two possible sites, on a strip of grass to the north of the church and the other on a traffic island known locally as Jimmy's Green, where Carenza's about to open Trench 2. Jimmy's Green's a rare piece of open ground and we're hoping that it should produce evidence of Saxon buildings. Right, so is that where the Saxon church was? Um, we don't really know. Uh, we suspect there probably was a church there, but there's no evidence from that church that it's actually Saxon. So it may have been a subsidiary church of the monastery, not, but certainly not the principal not church. Not the main one. No. So we're looking for sort of settlement remains here, are we? That's what we'd hope to find. That's right. Well, we're in, we're in the core of the uh, Saxon monastery, so perhaps we're hoping to find the, the boundary of the core area of the monastery, um, perhaps uh, remains of uh, small churches in that core area, but, but certainly settlement-type remains, yeah. So their first task is to lift the roses, carefully, and get the digger in to remove the turf and get the trench started. Well, it's all right for you lot in here. It's dripping <laughs> down there. What you got for us? What we're trying to do here is get some idea of, of what's gone on over the, the, the time since the monastery was established. Yeah. And just trying to get a feel for the whole thing as a peninsula, a headland. We know there's a cemetery area down here another cemetery area just south of the church 
Some buildings have been found in excavation up here with alignments for fences or precinct boundaries. How does all this fit together and are there any clues still in the street patterns and the earlier maps yeah. which help us work out what the layout of this monastic establishment would have been like? Why are we so excited about the prospect of digging up another monastery? I mean, ah, we must have dug up an awful lot. But this is, this is a special one. This is Why? It. Well, because it's, it's very early. It's one of these 7th century ones. We know very little about them. Uh, we don't know what the layout was, you know, how people lived in it. It's a double monastery as well, which a lot of them were. What does that mean? It had monks and nuns in it. Under one roof? Uh, not quite, but within the same enclosure, ruled over by an abbess. And they were very common in the Anglo-Saxon period. Because I always think of monasteries as stone buildings yeah. and guys with tonsures. This is nothing like that. You know, the idea of something like Tintin or Revo or Fountains, you have to put right out of your mind. This is much more irregular plan, scattered buildings, mainly of timber, and probably more than one church. A very, very different sort of establishment altogether. We know less about these monasteries than we know about either Roman villas yeah. or even many prehistoric known area of, of British archaeology. Well, we're underway now, Kevin. <laughs> no turning back. <laughs> no, no, definitely not turning back now. And you're no second thoughts about it? No, I'm not, I'm not sure of it. I mean, how long have you been living here? Just over two years. And did you know there were bodies underneath your lawn? I did actually know there was bodies under there, but I had an idea there's something going on down there. Well, we ain't got any bodies yet, but we do have just a little bit of history of your garden. It's Queen Victoria Penny. Oh, one of the old pennies, yeah? Yeah. So there you go, about 50 years after the houses were built up, somebody was sitting out on the lawn Very and nice. dropped that. Very nice. It's a nice piece of history. Yeah. Back at Trench 2 on Jimmy's Green, the roses have come out and the diggers just starting to expose the foundations of the Victorian school that once stood here. I attended that school. You, you attended five, it? Yes. Oh, good. I've got some old. pictures here of the, oh, yes. the school. I don't know if you remember oh, it. Oh, yes. Yeah. You bring back memories now, <laughs> didn't you? Yes. Presumably the roof was a bit better when you went there. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes. A lot better. And there's oh, some fireplaces as well. Isn't yes, it? open fires, great yeah. big open fires. And the milk used to, the little bottles of milk used to be around the fires warming in the winter, you know. Oh, okay. oh, warm oh yes. Yeah. yes, it was horrible. Yeah, it's, horrible. <laughs> <laughs> it's got the digger started up again, shall we? We also need to find the boundaries of the monastery to establish its size. So we're widening our search to the largest area of open ground on the headland, Town Moor, to see if the site would have extended this far. You can see now what you're doing having cleaned the rain off. So what have we got then? Well, we've got this area of open ground here. It's actually, there's lots of earthworks on it. Yeah. And there's some quite interesting ones. There's things uh, showing up on the air photograph as well. You see through the grey. See that line showing? down through there. Yeah, where's that on the ground then? That's that bank oh, yeah. you probably yep. see through them. It's yep. coming up yep. this way. It gets very confused. Yeah. I'd quite yep. like to know what that is, but there's all sorts of things going on here. We've got 18th century, 19th century, 20th century military activity. That's shown on maps. There's been a lot yeah. of things going it's on. It's an ideal place looking out over the sea. Yeah, that's that the is. problem from our point of view though. All this later activity, we've scanned over quickly already. And we're getting lots of noisy results. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's obviously this later stuff that's going on. Whether we can see any detail below that, I'm, I'm not sure. But it still represents a, a really open area next to where we're interested in, so you know we're bound to have a look at it, aren't we? Yeah, really? Yeah. It's on, Are you sure? Yeah, it's on the build side. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure it's necessary in this weather. <laughs> well, I, I think we wouldn't put the diggers in yet because it's too wet. But, <laughs> That's but, what but I mean. I don't yeah. see why the geofish shouldn't carry on. <laughs> well, you <be> brilliant. <laughs> I'll be having a coffee in the dry. <laughs> So while geophysics brave the elements on Town Moor, Robin Daniels and I take refuge from the weather in the Church of St Hilda, where one of the Anglo-Saxon name stones is kept. And Robin Bush has been trying to find out more about the saint who has given her name to the church. Hi, Tony. There she is in all her glory. St Hilda? Is yep. that my Princess Hild? Yes, one of the most influential women in the whole of England. She was the great-niece of King Edwin, one of the most powerful kings of Northumbria. 
And when he was baptised into the Christian faith by St Paulinus in 627, she got dunked along with him. How do we know about her? Well, uh, fortunately, the, the Venerable Bede, in his History of the English Church and People, uh, writes her up at great length. If it wasn't for him, all she'd be would be a single line in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. He was a great fan of hers. He talks about how so great was her prudence that not only ordinary folk, but kings and princes used to come and ask her advice in their difficulties and take it. Yeah, but presumably that was just propaganda. She was probably tetchy and bossy for all we know. But she was still crucial, because at her monastery in 664 at Whitby, uh, they held the Synod, the Synod of Whitby, at which the English church finally made the decision uh, to go along with the Roman church, uh, in terms of calculating Easter, and not the old Celtic variety. And look what we've got, an Anglo-Saxon <laughs> cross. It's the name stone, so it names the person it commemorated, uh, Hildithrith, presumably named after St Hilda. What does this mean to you? Well, it's lovely to have it here in the church, and uh, we're particularly excited at the moment, in the millennium year, as we think that it was Hilda at that synod that gave us AD and O'Domine. Back on the seafront in Trench 1, Phil's found some bones. This could be our first indication that we're looking in the right place for the nun's burial ground. And forensic archaeologist Margaret Cox is casting her eye over Phil's finds. Totally, no, I'm afraid of that. Sorry? I don't like the look of any of these. I don't think there's anything there that looks very human. No, in fact, I think they're all definitely not human. Well, I mean, they are bones, aren't they? Well, they well, are bones. But well, then, then bones don't stop being so biased. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Beastie, I'm afraid, all of them. But it is in very, very good condition. Is, so if we is... do get uh, a burial, yeah, it, it does all grow well for the it condition of does, it. It does, yeah. I think we've got every reason to be optimistic. We need to extend our search for the boundary ditch that separated the monastery from the outside world. So we're going to open a third trench in Lumley Street, the area to the north of the church. So you didn't actually dig in this area, you dug over the back there. That's right, this was still a road then, uh, but now they've, they've laid this grass down so it's available to what, us. What, that road we can see going back to the Victorian church came through here? That's right, yeah. Well, aren't we going to have a lot of asphalt and concrete and stuff underneath then? We are, yes, but we should be able to go through that with a JCB without too much trouble. Right, and what would we expect to find here then? Well, what we're hoping to find is the boundary of the Saxon monastery. This ditch here, we've just seen a very small part of it, but it seems to come through right the way through the area we're standing, which is just here. Is this the, the outer boundary to the monastery then? Uh, Yes. <laughs> what, maybe. What do you mean, yes, maybe? So hang on, you're not sure. So if we did find more of it here, that might give us a chance to identify whether it really is like to be outside boundary. That's right, absolutely, yeah. What happens if we get occupation that way outside as well as inside? I will blow that theory out. Absolutely, all my hypotheses go out the window. So we open another trench. But it's not going to be easy. We need to get the turf lifted and the top soil removed before the digger can be brought in to cut through the road surface in Trench 3. Whilst in Trench 1, Phil's been kept busy entertaining the local residents. Phil? Hello, Tony. This lady wants to know if you've got permission to dig in that garden. <laughs> it's a bit late now if we haven't, isn't it, eh? <laughs> Come look. Yeah, by all means. Can I get in? Yeah, but just get down in here. You're boots are really, really dirty. Look, this beautiful brown level, we are actually on to the Saxon levels. How do you know that? Well, you have a look at this. Won't that excite you? It's a bit of coal. It is not a bit of coal. It is Anglo-Saxon pottery. Yeah? And what's more, look, we've got a second piece. Isn't that a beautiful little rim? Now, how do you know that that is pottery? Well, look, this is the most obvious one. Look at that. Do you see there's that beautiful little outturned rim? Yeah. There are probably no more than about half a dozen sherds of Saxon pottery from the whole of the site. We've been here digging here for one morning and we got two pieces. In spite of my initial scepticism, we've managed to reconstruct Phil's pot. And this is what it would have looked like 1,200 years ago. A very rare little piece of Anglo-Saxon pottery. Carenza's down to the Saxon layers too, and is still searching for either a boundary ditch which might have enclosed the sacred area of the monastery, or if we're lucky, a monastic building. Very hollow under there, isn't there? Hello there. Oh, hi there. Actually, this is really timely. I think we've um, 
We think we're down onto the Saxon layers, so that said, we haven't had any Saxon pottery to prove it. This orange soil is certainly Saxon soil, and it seems to me that again we're, we're in amongst a Saxon Saxon feature here. Right, and, so and you if think... I'm, unless I'm much mistaken, Carenza, we've just found a piece of decorated stonework. Look at that, that's worked. Uh, really? That's that's not what it looks like naturally? No, it's not. That, that's been worked. And well, I think there's lots maybe of that stuff. It's here and here. Well, I think some of these are natural striations, but some of these look as though they, they've been worked. Um, in which, if, if it is the case, then we've, we've got work stonework from a from a building, um, which would be... From what sort of building? Well, it could could well be the church. Uh, it could be... The uh, church? Well... Are you serious about it? <laughs> this is work stone from the church? It, it, it could be. <laughs> I think I mean, I'd, I'd like to see these pieces out, but if if they are, it, it's, it's very exciting. We've got very little evidence of the stone building, of any stone buildings from Harkerpool. This is in the Saxon soil, so it, 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 it should be right, and the, it looks as though some of these stones at least have worked. That's, so a, that's, un, that's amazing. I mean, I, yes. I'm, I, I'm done. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> Phil's extending his search for the cemetery and is moving a few doors up to number seven South Crescent. End of day one, and what have we got? A skip load of dirt, and another skip load of dirt, and a great big hole in the ground where we found two little lumps that look like charcoal. Yeah, Saxon pottery, that is. But have we found any graves? Not yet, no, but there still might be in there. So what are we going to do tomorrow? Well, we started another one up here. You see where Phil is up there? Yeah. Well, we've, we're taking the, the topsoil off that garden. We're still looking for the cemetery that produced the inscribed graves. So no front garden in Hartlepool safe from the time team. Now the weather's improved, we can have a better look at the town more. It's covered in the lumps and bumps that Stuart normally gets so excited about. But what are the results of the geophysics survey going to show us? John, how are you getting on? Oh, well, <laughs> noisy? <laughs> yes, just a bit. This is the problem we talked about yesterday. Yeah. And I mean, we've got lots of service pipes, later military stuff, and that's causing all these distortions. Yeah. And I mean, it really is confusing. Yeah. So if we ignore that <laughs> and just look at this plot, you yeah. can see the lines again. So we're ignoring these. Yeah. What's of interest is, yeah. what do you think Ooh, of that? Oh, round corner. <laughs> that always says Roman, 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 Roman <laughs> fort, doesn't it? Roman? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm expecting like a, Roman. It looks like a Roman fort, doesn't well. it, with a rounded corner on it? If it's an early monastery, it might have been plonked in a Roman fort. That's right, it? I mean, a number of them have, have been placed in Roman forts. And, and even if it's not, I mean, it's always possible you've got something here that may relate to the Saxon monastery, perhaps an enclosure for a, for a palace or something like, something right. like the high status site, because it's a royal monastery. Yeah. Stuart, you look uh, a bit sceptical. Yeah. I, 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 I'm not entirely happy with what I'm seeing here as a total package for an Anglo-Saxon palace or a big monastic precinct. So it might be modern, it might be civil yeah, war, yeah, it might be it Roman, could it might be, be Saxon anything. palace. Yeah. Why don't we put a trench across <laughs> the front of it and have yes. a look? At South Crescent, our search for the cemetery continues. The diggers still taking out the topsoil from trench four at number seven. Oh, Margaret, you're up bright and early. Yeah, but in the front yeah. garden of number three, Margaret Cox thinks she may have found something. Well, it's looking ominously oh, like uh, an east-west linear feature, which I guess could be a grave. It's right in the corner, too. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, can I come down and have a look? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Well, I'll tell you what, to uh, Margaret, the natural, that is nice natural. That's the yeah, first time it we've, very clear, we've seen it? that, that nice, oh, God, ah, that's beautiful stuff. I haven't quite got the edge of the cut there, I don't, no, think. I don't think. I think so that can either. go back a bit. My concern, Phil, is that if that is actually the end, and if there's a coffin in there, we might not get any evidence of bone in it, so we might not be able to see whether it's a grave or not without taking it further back anyway. It would certainly be better if we could have a little bit more length to it, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah, because then we could say definitively whether it's a grave or not before we think about whether or not to extend the trench this way. That sounds like the best policy. So that's great news. Ten o'clock on day two, and we may have found our first evidence of the name Stone Cemetery. But what about the worked stones they found on Jimmy's Green in Trench 2? Carenza? Hello. You found Robin's church? <laughs> well, we've certainly been doing some more looking at it. Um, the You're being diplomatic, I can hear that already. <laughs> I'm trying to be, yeah. Um, this, this spread of rubble here was uh, what we were looking at yesterday, and it was these parallel markings on, on the stones here that, that Robin was thinking might, might mean they were carved. But 
quite honestly, Robin, nearly all the stones in here have those parallel marks. And we're, we're thinking now probably it looks more like that's just natural weathering. And this is just rubble spread in a yard or something. Yes, I think I'm backpedalling like mad on this one. <laughs> <laughs> We've set up a workshop to recreate a book in the style of one that might have been produced by the Northumbrian monks of Hartlepool. Owen's using a technique known as knot work to produce a raised border that will provide a frame for the Celtic design he's going to tool into the leather. And Jim's using this original Anglo-Saxon mould found on an earlier dig to make a silver medallion for the book cover. Books were very precious in the 7th century and the monasteries needed to produce their own scriptures by hand. Yep, I'm rediscovering the finer art. Meyer's going back to basics to recreate St Hilda's family tree in the style of an Anglo-Saxon illuminated manuscript. Well, what about round the... is that... If you big, a... Even Mick seems to be getting in on the act. There. Not the whole of it. Aren't you supposed to be in the trenches? No, no, I'm an artist as well, you see, a man of many parts. So oh, I see. I'm doing very well. Well, I don't know, we haven't done, you know, it's a bit wobbly, that bit. And this is actually how people would have done illuminated manuscripts? Yeah, I mean, what we've actually got here, you know, you know that you. back, Mario, is, is a little microcosm of, you know, what went on in many of these monasteries. And who were the people who would have done this? This would have been done by the monks and the nuns, depending on what skill they've got. And would these have been relatively wealthy people or just people off the land? Uh, no, no, the, most of the monks and nuns, certainly the nuns, were aristocratic ladies. What were they doing it for? Well, ultimately, it's for the greater glory of God, just as the services were in the church. So that every work they produced, whether it was metalworking or book production or whatever, was, you know, to, to give their best. And it's actually incredible stuff. If you look at uh, something like one of these carpet pages from the Lindisfarne Gospels. We can see how elaborate it is, how the elaborate patterns and colouring in it. Giraldus Cambrensis, who was a, a 12th century monk, uh, when he saw the Book of Kells uh, in Ireland, which is similar work to this, of the same sort of date, said, this wasn't the work of men, this must be the work of angels. And that sums it up, really. It really is a peninsula from up here, isn't it? It is, although it's it's masked by all this later shipyard and harbour development. Well, all, all these cars and everything is all infill. Yes, see, all this has been built up since the, the 19th century. If it wasn't connected to the mainland, it would it would be remarkably like the site at Lindisfarne, further up, where Bishop Hayden established the monastery, where, which influenced this one. Right. It's almost as if they've got a mirror image. That might fit well with an isolated monastery. What it doesn't fit very well with is the Roman fort, I'm afraid. No, it's stuck just right out in the middle of it. It's an island, no, that's island. true. Right, you see where the Sandy Bay is next to the pier? Yeah, yeah. That actually would fit perfectly with a sheltered landing spot. Yeah. Now that's actually quite close. Just below it, isn't it? To, to where our, our, our site yeah. is thought to be. That's where we seem to be getting real evidence. Right. Just off the east end of the church. Which is really where you and I would expect to find something like right, that, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. On Town Moor, Trench 5 is proving to be a bit of a disappointment. There are no Roman finds or any other archaeological features, just modern service ditches. So although we haven't found a Saxon palace here, we do know that the monastery didn't extend this far onto the Town Moor. Which should mean that our other trenches are in the right location to find evidence of buildings from the core area of the monastery. And in Trench 3, the diggers making light work of the old road surface. Meanwhile, Phil's been wrestling with the archaeology in Trench 1. I mean, we've been looking for edges and saying, ah, let's chase that one. So you discover or try to find out where the edge is. I heard on the comms you we, even thought you had a grave at We one did time. indeed, yeah, look, this was where our grave was going to be. And we thought it was cut through this really solid limestone natural. And it would nicely be in there. But look what's happened to the fill. It's actually running underneath. This is just an isolated island, a pocket of limestone gravel. And it, it's just all disturbed. It is, it is just glacial. So you've had a good time, but we haven't found anything. <laughs> We've had an amazingly challenging time. We've had a lot of fun, but no, we haven't found anything. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're closing down this trench, but if you want to stay with us, we're going to dig up another front garden further along the street. So we close down Trench 1 and Phil moves four doors up the Crescent where he'll continue to search for the Namestone Cemetery in Trench 4. 
On Jimmy's green, Carenza's still trying to unravel the archaeology in this complicated trench. And five skips of soil later... We've got masses coming out now. We're starting to get into the Saxon archaeology. We've got the... Um, uh, where that slot's strung out there. We've, that, that's clearly a cut down into the natural. So that looks like that's some sort of Saxon ditch or building. And then over here, we've done a couple of sections into that long beam slot we had. The beam slots used in these Anglo-Saxon buildings would have been hollowed into the ground and then the wooden posts lowered into them and secured into position with rubble and soil. So when the wood rots, all that remains of the building is the beam slot and some rubble. Carenza's priority now is to find the corner of the building to establish how big it would have been and what it might have been used for. It's been quite interesting looking at the topography of this yeah. particular peninsula because there are a number of factors here which make it very similar to, to Lindisfarne. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for a safe anchorage, a safe place to birth, to establish a monastery, mm -hmm. the first opportunity you get in the rock pattern is just round this corner here. Sure. It's sheltered, it's safe. That's actually on the slope immediately below where St Hilda's church is now. Yeah. If you look on this other air photograph, you can see this is the safe harbour area here around the edge of the rocks where you get shelter. St Hilda's is here and we've got no evidence from anywhere else north or east of that of any Saxon finds whatsoever despite all the development all the expansion mm. nothing at all all the distribution is down here so it does point to the monastic core being typed down on this corner here. Yeah. Well, this is St Hilda's Street. Street. Yeah, and in front of us is St Hilda Chair, or Whatever Char. That means. Mick's been doing a bit of field work, and yeah. he's been knocking on doors, and he gave me to believe, if we come up here by these garages... St Hilda's said, garages, presumably. Yeah, very likely. Yeah. He said, come on up here. It's number six, Where he said. Going? Well, I don't know, Robin. <laughs> Mid-afternoon on day two, and we still haven't found any evidence of the Anglo-Saxon Namestone Cemetery to support the Victorian newspaper reports. So Phil and I set out to locate a third garden to excavate. I think her name's Barbara. Right. Hello, are you Barbara? Hi. Yes. Oh, that's a relief. We got in the right place. This is Phil. Uh, is it all right if we excavate in your garden? Fine. Go ahead. Just like that? Yeah, absolutely. How much can we dig? T tell us what we can dig and yeah. what we can't. Whatever you like. You're sure? Mm -hmm. Take the garage down too. Take the garage? Mm -hmm. That would be great, Phil. We could ah. get a JCB in. Ah, but hang on though, Tony. I mean... We're dismantling the garage anyway. Yeah, but, uh, we're a bit short on time. I reckon a hand dug trench to start no, with. Don't big to start with. We can always negotiate down. No, you need to <laughs> Trust well, me. Thank you push. very much. Owen's copying the cover of an original Saxon manuscript that still survives today and is the sort of book that St Hilda would have known. We're also casting the medallion in silver from the mould that Jim made yesterday. The image of a calf, the emblem of St Luke. And it'll take pride of place on the front of our book. In trench three, Carenza's just found a small piece of metalwork, but they can't decide what it is. So you think period. that might be a, say, late pagan, early Christian Anglo-Saxon object? That was, that was my first thought when I, when I saw it, but that's the material I'm most familiar with. Yeah. What I had thought initially was it might be something like a garter hook, which is that, but again, it's that it's triangular. What's a garter hook for? It really is just holding up your garter. <laughs> um, but again, it's, it's, it's that different shape. Beginning of day three, and Stuart thinks that there's evidence that there might have been an early church building here, which is why John's doing some more exploration. But if there is a church building here, then presumably something associated with it ought to stretch in this direction, which is why we've been given permission to dig in the grounds of this very elegant looking building, which happens to be Hartlepool Conservative Club. Morning, Tony. Good morning. <laughs> morning, Tony. <laughs> so where are we going to dig? Probably up this corner here, near the wall. You see, I mean, over there, where these new developments are, there was an excavation there, what, about 20 years ago, yeah. and they actually did find a cemetery. What we don't know is how far it extends this way. Or how it relates to the church, And even. we are getting very, very close to the edge of the hill that has actually yeah. got the site of the monastery on it. But we've got an awful lot of trenches open, all the ones over by the sea where we've been digging in the front gardens. How are we going to get the resources with one day left yeah, well, to dig a trench here? Well, we, we've talked about that overnight, and we're going to shut most of those down because the, there isn't any evidence of cemetery down there. 
So we've got all those people we can bring up here. So we, we reckon we've got enough labour, don't yeah, we? Yeah, no problem. So, how long? But we reckon about three by two. We'll, we'll make sure we come well clear of the wall. We don't want that coming down. So we'll be in this corner here somewhere. You ready to start? Yeah. 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 Uh, we do have to give you temporary membership of the Conservative Party in order to allow you to dig here. <laughs> We've currently got six trenches open, so the two remaining garden trenches will have to be closed. We haven't found any signs of the elusive nun's burial ground yet, and we're beginning to doubt whether we ever will. Carenza's still supervising the work in Trench 2, where they found signs of a building, and Trench 3, where she's found a small piece of metalwork. Carenza? Oh, hello. Any news on the nun suspender? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's got even better. I mean, yesterday we were thinking it was attached to a bit of clothing. But in fact, we've now sent it off to experts at Durham who have said, one, yes, it is Saxon, could either be late Saxon or mid Saxon, either would be fine, which is brilliant because it's dating the ditch that we've got in the mm. trench, so it's our monastic boundary. The best guess for what it is at the moment is a hasp from a book. It's the sort of lock bit, if you like, like on a child's diary where you have a little lock yeah. around it. It would have been riveted onto the book here and then the lock would have, would have gone through there to keep it shut. He talks about people studying the scriptures here, but we've had, never had any direct evidence that actually had books here yeah. or scriptures of any kind, so that's, that's great. I mean, so it's the next best thing to a stylus, isn't it? It shows literacy, it shows presumably book production, or they've yeah. got a collection of books, they're using books. It's fantastic. It's what you'd expect of a high-status monastery. And what are we going to do with this trench now? Well, we're trying to do... We've got the far edge of the ditch where Ian and the red hat there is. Um, what we're trying to do is find the other side of it and then, of course, start going in and taking the fill out because if this is what we've had from just at the top, what mm. might else might we find going down into it? In Trench 7, back at Conservative Party headquarters, we're looking for remains of the Saxon church or anything associated with it. Phil's left the digger to get on with it, while he's gone round the corner back to Barbara's garden to check on the progress of Trench 6, where he's found some Victorian foundations. You're still digging, Phil? Oh, God, ah, yeah, yeah, it's a um, bit of a problem here, Mick. Come on in. <laughs> God, it looks recent by the drain. <laughs> well, that's it. I mean, it is a marvellously solid wall. You see, it's through this soil again. And this oh, is the yeah, stuff yeah. we've got elsewhere on the site with the medieval pottery. So they've actually dug a foundation trench through it, put all this foundation stone in to make a real good solid base for the wall. Yeah. And this, right at the bottom of this soil, is where our Saxon's going to be. Oh. Now, can you imagine trying to open yeah. out this area of a trench right the way down through there? We're going to create so much spoil. Yeah. Even if there is anything Saxon down there, I yeah. don't think we're going to reach it. It's hardly worth it, is it really? It's going to be very, very impractical to get there. Yeah, so you, we're moving towards the idea of shutting this one down then, do you think? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's good, a little bit of archaeology. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's, it's but so a difficult. Yeah. yeah, a bit late. Okay, yep. Carenza, oh, are you absolutely oh. definite now that this is Anglo-Saxon? Yep, definitely, and that's our building. Look, you can see the foundation trench coming along like that, then there's the break in it where the doorway was, and it goes up there, turns round into the other side of the building. So if you say that this is cobbling in the yard outside the building, do we know what this area would have been used for? Well, there are sort of three possibilities, really, at the moment. One is that it's something small, like a monk's cell. Um, one is um, that it's a workshop, which is sort of what the fines, in as much as we've got any, are suggesting at the moment. There's three bits of this sort of copper-bronze alloy, which they all look a bit tatty and broken up, and we're, they feel as if they may just be broken bits from something being made rather than broken, finished items. We're not even certain about that. And the third possibility is it might be really quite big and be something like a church. Could it actually be the size of the big building that we were in last night? Yeah. It's always possible, yeah. yeah. And have you had anything that big here before? No, never, no. So how do we ascertain that? We extend the trench. <laughs> Underneath the spoil heap? We'll have to move the spoil heap. Uh, disturb Victor, unfortunately, of course, he's standing on top of it. There. Poor old Victor, you're going to have to move, mate. <laughs> My strategic plot. And I think he's going to have to alter his drawing, isn't he? Just a little, I think. And having removed the spoil heap, Carenza then found that the building extended straight down the middle of the original trench. Still, she's also managed to establish that it is a substantial structure, and according to Robin, it's larger than any building found so far on the headland. So although we still don't know how large this building was, we do know that it's a significant discovery and must be included on Victor's drawing of Hartlepool Monastery. Phil's back in South Crescent, 
and he's thinking about closing down Trench 4. That's a big old piece of bone, isn't it? It's quite a big bit thing. It is, yeah. It looks like it's going... It's going right back into the section. It is. Oh, that, is oh, big, that is a big old bit of bone. I don't think it is you, do you? Oh, no. Maybe we can get Margaret to have a look at it. Be happier with her opinion on it. Our book's nearly finished now, and Owen's preparing to bind Maya's drawing of St Hilda's family tree. What have we got there then, Phil? Oh, Margaret, got some bone we ought you know, have a look at. Oh, good. I, I don't know, but I, I was thinking it might be looking very much human. Yeah, yeah, I think I might agree with that. Yeah? I mean, certainly... This is this loose? Yeah. 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 This. This is a distal radius, so it's the sort of inside of the wrist, and that's definitely human. Um, it was that way, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, this little one here might be human, though I'm not 100% sure. But unfortunately, it's quite badly damaged. How about this big one here? Well, it looks. My instant reaction is that it's the, the tibia. I'm not 100% certain. It seems a bit strange on this end. So, I mean, it really looks then as we as though we've actually got our seafront cemetery. At last, 11.30 on day three, just as we're about to close down Trench 4, we seem to have found signs of a burial. Oh, shit, I've got to trust my trusty box. But in Lumley Street in Trench 3, where we found the hasp, there haven't been any more finds, and we've now established that the ditch is far too small to be the monastic boundary. So we now think it was more likely to have been an internal boundary fence that would have enclosed the monk's cells. So we're going to record it, shut it down, and concentrate on Trench 4. Can I come in? Yeah. Yeah, we've actually got the whole lower part of the skeleton. we covered it up. Oh, wow. Look. There's one leg, there's the other leg, there's one kneecap there, there's one there, and underneath these slabs we've got both the thighs and the pelvis, and the whole thing is disappearing underneath this bulk. And what can we tell about it so far, Margaret? Well, it's quite a small individual, quite gracile. We don't know yet whether it's a male or a female, but it's definitely orientated sort of north-south. And have we got any clues as to whether it actually is Anglo-Saxon? Well, all the dirt that you see there, that dark material, has got medieval pottery in it. So these, this body is underneath the medieval layers. It must be Anglo-Saxon. So what do we do now? Well, we're going to cover up that bit to protect it, put the plastic back on, and we're going to bash out an area there uh, in the bulk. Without bringing the house down into Without the bringing the house down. You stood here, yeah. it's almost the exact spot you stood on the edge of this building here. Yeah. In 1921, skeletons were found at this exact spot. There were two skeletons. 1921? 1921. Oh, right. Digging a, a gas trench yeah. down here. Yeah. And they give you a firm measurement out from that corner of the house. So yeah. they, you know, this, is, this is a very firm find of skeletons yeah. here. So our skeleton in there and those found there are really suggesting it's all that way. Up, up towards the, the lighthouse way. Stewart's documentary evidence, combined with the location of our burial, proves definitively that we've at last found the Namestone Cemetery. But there's still one big question that needs to be answered. Uh, getting any nearer deciding whether it's male or female? Yeah, I think it's a, a female, Phil. If you look at the skyatic notch, it's very wide and very open, and that generally indicates that it's female. If it was a male, it would be much tighter. Right. So it looks female from that, as far as which is what say. we were hoping. Oh yeah, <laughs> you were hoping. Yeah. Robin, hi, right, Tony. Sorry not to have been here before, but all hell's broken loose down the <laughs> other end of town. Oh, this is a good-looking trench, isn't it? It is some nice archaeology. It's not Anglo-Saxon, but it's very nice. Can I come in? Certainly, yeah. What is it then? It's a medieval building. It, it runs this way from the frontage. We've got a boundary wall here, a hearth over there, and another hearth here. All the finds from Trench 7 are high-status medieval goods, and the buildings are too important to disturb. There's no chance of getting down to the Saxon levels by the end of the day, so we'll record it and close it down. Top to the left of it. 
you're going off at a kilter. No, to the way. Mm. Don't know your lefts and your rights. In the early days of Christianity, some pagan practices lingered on, and churches and burials were often aligned north-south and not east-west as they were later. This means that our skeleton was probably buried when the monastery was first established. What is it? Northwest, southeast, exactly. It looks like the lo lower end of the humerus. That's right. Here. There she yeah. goes, and that'll run on up through, so I can get. I'll get rid of that. With a bit of luck, that arm will be outside the ribs, so that'll be our furthest extent, really, won't it? Yeah. Do you think she'd have been likely to have been sort of bound up in any way? I mean, she does seem to be quite tightly packaged in here. She does. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if she wasn't in a shroud. I mean, look at how close together her ankles yeah. are. Yeah. And that wouldn't happen. If she was in a coffin, that just wouldn't happen no. like that. So either she was sort of in a shroud and sort of swaddled almost. And they did used to use a linen wrap around bodies in the very early period. So that's quite possible. And we've certainly got no evidence of coffin nails either, no. so I'm fairly convinced that we can rule that one out. Why are we walking through the churchyard then, Stuart? Well, I've never been attracted by this idea of the focus around this side of the headland. Yeah, yeah. Well, when we've been going all around the edge of this great big churchyard and the, the 12th century church. Yeah. And when I looked from down there and looked up this way, I could see that it flattened off across here. Well, it's, very, we, it's very noticeable, yeah, isn't so it? So it slopes up and then flattens yeah. off completely. That's very distinct and very flat. That struck me that there might be earlier buildings here, perhaps yeah. a, a monastic core. So yeah. ask John if he'd have a look and see what he could find on the ground. Come back down and see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you usually tell me that it's difficult to do geophysics it is, in graveyards. It's always difficult in graveyards. The disturbance there's disturbance the... from the graves and so on, but we usually ask to look for graves. Ah, right. Yeah. Here Stuart's asked us to look for something different. Yeah. And here you can see all the individual graves. Yeah. But what we've got is this mass Wow. of high resistance, this black, no. suggests to me building rubble, stone, masonry. So in fact that belt is all across That's all this, across this the, the bank. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. extend the length of the graveyard. Yeah. Are there any structures showing through it at all, John? Well, we've tried to look more deeply into the ground, um, and the suggestion of structures, I can't actually see clear wall lines yeah. though, yeah. but it's going quite deep. So we might be in the middle of a whole set of buildings that predate the laying out of the 12th century church and the churchyard. It all seems to be coming together now and looks as if we might have found one more vital piece of the jigsaw to add to our reconstruction. And it's been under our noses all along, here in the graveyard. Okay, and so there it's it done, is. is it? Yes, oh, that's wow. it, just finished. It's Amazing. really cleaned up nicely, <laughs> Jim, since I last saw it. Yeah, that's mm. brilliant. And there's the 7th century original the mould. The mold. That's pretty good, that is, Jim. Mm. Yeah, it's come out well. Done. Mm. Yeah. What's it like inside? Well, we've got Maya's piece of artwork there. Oh, yeah, look, look at, at that. that. It really Wonderful. finishes it off, doesn't it? Can we have a look nice. inside? Family nice. tree. This is the family tree. That's right. <laughs> It covers fantastic with the tooling on, isn't it, the, the raised bits. Yeah. And now, of course, from the excavations, we've got one of these book clasps that had a piece of leather in it, and that would have gone one at the top and one at the bottom to hold the book together. Our book's finished, and the find from Trench 3 has provided a direct link with St Hilda's Monastery. Got it. Really Look good at condition. That. Look at that. Oh, yes, it is. Lovely. Look at that, yeah, there, there, there are the teeth, look, right in situ, right yeah. in the, and look, I'm just coming round onto the chin. That's smashing. It's a good set yeah. of teeth, actually, it is, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, they're, 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 they're quite, they're going right the way down. Yeah. Right? So what are the key bits that we're really looking for now, then? Well, it'd be nice to get a handle on her age to see whether she was a young woman or an older woman when she died, and now that you've exposed the teeth, that's going to be a great help in that. But, I mean... You know, is there any part of this skeleton that we're missing that, that well, is crucial? I don't think so. I mean, I mean she strikes me as being remarkably complete. I think she's in very good condition, yeah. It's, I think we're just so lucky that it's so deep and so tacky and everything that she's in such good condition. We can now show that the Namestone Cemetery was sited on the cliffs as the Victorians stated, but it lay further east than had been previously thought. We've built up a much better picture of the headland in Saxon times. 
Visitors to this isolated monastery would have approached by sea and berthed their boats in the safe harbour. From there, they would have walked up to the sacred heart of the site, passing through the monastic boundary fence, where ahead of them lay two or more churches that served the community of monks and nuns. To the north, there would have been a small enclosure of monks' cells, where they'd have worked on some of the earliest Gospels to be written in England. Finally, they'd have passed a much larger wooden building as they walked east towards the Namestone Cemetery on the cliff. Phil, she hasn't half come on since I was here last. Yeah, it's quite incredible, isn't it, Tony? I mean, not only have we got virtually an intact skeleton, but she's in such incredible condition. And what can we tell about her, Margaret? Well, we know she's about five feet tall, over 30, and seems to be in reasonably good health. And what happens to her now? Well, we really must lift her because I think it's going to rain. Um, so we need to get this lifted as soon as possible. This really has been the most incredible three days. We've had our Anglo-Saxon finds, we've had our Anglo-Saxon building, we've had the medieval part of the story, and of course, our lovely skeleton. Everything that we've looked for, in fact, has come to light. Margaret, yes. if we're going to date her, which bit will we use for dating? We'll use this piece of, of radius. So this will go away for dating now, and hopefully, if we get a date on her, we'll be able to tell whether or not she was a contemporary of the great Abbess Hild, who presided over the monastery at Hartlepool over 1,300 years ago. Carbon dating tests have established that she was indeed a contemporary of St Hilda and lived sometime between 630 and 770. She was probably one of her nuns and would have lived here in Hartlepool when Christianity was being reintroduced to England in the 7th century. Once the tests have been completed, she'll be given a Christian burial at St Hilda's Church and will once again lie in consecrated ground. <laughs>